Why don't we pray? What if we all believe what I just told you? What if we all believe that the effectual for a prayer of a righteous man avails much? What if we all believe that we could pray without ceasing and see very good results? What would we do? What if a nation full of God's children stood, on, stood in the breach, stood before God for the people of the land? To turn away his wrath from destroying us. Let me say that again. What if a nation. Full of God's children. Stood before him. On behalf of the people of the land. So that he would not destroy them. Let me give you two scriptures. The first one is. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 24. Samuel said. And I want to understand this because we think that sin is only adultery and fornication. God forbid, Samuel said, God forbid that I should sin, that I should sin in ceasing to pray for you. When you are not praying for others, that's sin. Let's read it here because I say some things these days that y'all don't understand. Y'all don't think that in the scripture sometimes y'all think that I'm into heresy. I am into 1 Samuel chapter 12, 24. I think it is. Yeah. No, not that one. I'm looking for the scripture that says, God forbid that I should sin in ceasing to pray for you, Israel. When you cease to pray for God's people, according to this verse, you're into sin. Anybody got that scripture quickly? Quickly? I really wanted to get this because sometimes you don't always understand. This will come up later on. Moreover, as for me, 12, 23, not 24. Listen to this. God forbid that I, Samuel, should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. When you don't pray for others, you are sinning against the Lord. Am I interpreting that correctly? That's what it says. Samuel said, God forbid that I should, should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. So we need to stand in the gap. Look at another scripture. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. All these are verses that we've been saying in this church for the last 20 years. You should know them by heart now. The Lord is here saying, hey, look for a man to stand in the gap. Who are you standing in the gap for other than yourself? Who are you standing in the gap for? Standing in the gap is only standing for one day. God said, I sought for a man, which is one man. I sought for a man that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. And I found none. So if I found none, what happened to the land? Talk to me. If I found none, what happened to the land? It was destroyed. You see your great responsibility that I'm talking about? You have a great responsibility. The church is at ease in Zion or better still, better still. The search has gone to excursion in the land of Nod. Believe me. They have their baskets out around the beach in the land of Nod. And everybody. <laughs> oh, that the church will wake up. Oh, that every church will have a culture of prayer and a culture of revival. I want you to go with me. That's where we are going. I sought for one man among them. My question again is, for whom are you standing in the gap? I'm standing in the gap for about three persons now with breast cancer. Two of whom are in the States getting treatment. I'm standing in the gap for 17 year olds in prison. Yeah? I'm standing in the gap for families that are so far torn apart. I mean, marriages. I'm standing in the gap for so many people. I don't even want to say it anymore because I don't want to come close to people know what I'm talking about. Who are you standing in the gap for? Many talk about standing in the gap. I don't mean just praying tonight and it's done. I mean praying until you see the answer, until the answer. Like, like you know the acronym PUSH, P-U-S-H? Pray until something happens. That's what you're talking about. Who 
stand in the gap for? I got to stand in the gap for this whole church. I have to stand in the gap for the whole church. We have another pastor, but it's my responsibility to stand in the gap. This is a day in, day out situation. This is a this is this is a forgetting food, forgetting medication. Put your life on the line and decide you're gonna fast because that's what God wants us to do. As a pastor, you gotta take all the humps and grumps. That's what you call for. It's like water and wet. You don't have one without the other. If you're a pastor, you know people things are gonna happen. And not everything that, that happened is bad. That is part of the journey. That's part of the job. Let me ask you the question again. Who are you standing in the gap for? I tell you where to start. If you can't think of anybody right now, you can start with me. Standing in the gap for me and for Pastor Chantel. Because you know, once you strike the shepherd, what will happen? The sheep will scatter. If you're not standing in the gap for anybody right now, stand in the gap for us. Stand in the gap for us. What, what, if we, what if we join in intercession for a total wave of God's presence so that the earth or the Pegwell community church will be filled with the knowledge of God? Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. That this church will be filled with the knowledge, with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. You see the waters cover the sea? Could we have the presence of God like a tidal wave in this church? If you would just pray, pray without the pastor having to tell you to pray. I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to work on something, but nobody else seems to be see what, to see what I'm doing. But right now, I'm not praying too much when I come to the microphone. I want you to pray. Because when I pray, you're going to listen to me. You're going to listen to what I'm saying. You're not going to be praying. So when it comes to this microphone, I try my best to reduce the amount of time. The amount of, I, I'm not here always to pray for you. I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to stand in the gap for somebody. So I heart. So you probably thought you probably think that I backslide because I don't pray like I did be yesteryear. No, I don't want to do that. I want you to pray. I want you to come into church, and before you get weary with all this singing, I want you to call upon God for yourself. I want to call on God for somebody. I want to invite the prince of God yourself. I don't, look, I sit in the congregation. I know once you have a mic and you're talking, everybody listens to you. Nobody prays. But that's not what we want. Huh? Look at this. Let me ask a question. What if we join the intercession? Not with the pastor with the microphone pushing you. Huh? For a tidal wave. You know what a tidal wave is? Say like a tsunami. A tidal wave of God's presence. That one Sunday morning, we come in here, 120 people, and everybody's speaking in tongues or on the floor or whatever. Or somebody, two or three people with a prophetic utterance. Or some person with an evangelistic experience brought the church, 10 persons, and said, these are the persons that I want for the Lord. If we could have a tidal wave of God's glory filling this house, look what Habakkuk said. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's what we want to see in church. And you know what happened? There'd be no difference between our Sunday morning service and the Thursday night service. Just like you are on edge to get here on Sunday mornings, when Thursday nights come, they'll be seen. This will be packed out. God is going to pack up the service just place now as soon as our seats get back together. You'll be surprised to see we're going to be looking and scuffling for seats. If you take this series that I'm dealing with you, if you take this seriously, what if God found us interceding for his bride, the church, that she will be cleansed and purified and expanded for his glory? What if God found us interceding for his bride, the church, Another foolish thing Creflo Dollar said is that the bride is not the church, the, the, uh, it's, not the, it's not the bride of Christ. Sometime a few years ago, no, the stupid thing he's saying is that you don't have to pay tithes for the day. Although it is in the New Testament, but that's just on the side to wake you up. Because we like news, you know. What if God found us interceding for the church? Question, when last did you intercede for the church at Pegwell? 
so that the church will be cleansed and purified and expanded. The church is shrinking right now. For the last two years, the church has lost 20% of its members worldwide. 20%. Thank God for us that we probably increased by 20%. But those big churches in America, seats are empty. There are no restrictions anymore. But people have joined the religion of the nuns. N-O-N-E-S. None. What's your religion? None. And that group of persons, that group is increasing the nuns. It ought not to be so. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. If we are, if we are going backward, it's not God's fault. You think God will refuse to hear a prayer of this church interceding for the, uh, for the, for the, for the bride of Christ? Or interceding for this church? Or interceding that the glory of God will fill this place? And when you come through this church doors, you come on business and it's not all trifling, stupid, stupid things like we do right now? You think God will refuse to hear a prayer like that? Or do you think he would grant those requests? Huh? And what if we began to pray this sort of prayer today? The third thing I'm going to tell you tonight, the first thing was express, expect fresh encounters. They might be unusual. The Lord may very well tell you to throw down your rod and it becomes a serpent. And then he tells you, take back up the serpent, but take it up by the tail. You know, that is crazy. Because if you take it by the tail, it could turn around about you. But that's faith in God. If God said it, that settles it. Huh? You, you understand what I'm saying? Let's expect fresh encounters in the church. I keep saying that right now, my next prayer is a worship leader might be naked down by the garrison working right now. God saves her and bring her into church. You obey this scripture, which we're going to put up on the screen now. There's a scripture that says, Henceforth, no I, no man after the flesh. Oh, you know that was scripture? Let's see it. Henceforth, which means from now on, no, no man after the flesh. When people come to church, no matter how bad they were, you don't know them anymore after the flesh. You know them after the spirit. They are born again. That old man is dead. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So I praise the worship leader came to church next Sunday. Well, I won't put it in the pulpit next Sunday. She'll go away a little bit. But if she put on her clothes and start to come to the page, welcome to the church. Hallelujah. None of you should be out the door saying, you know, she, she used to work down by the garrison. What is that to you? That's an insult to God and God forget that what you bring it up. She might be done by the garrison of necessity. She might be done by the garrison to feed the children. Did I just say she was doing something right? No, I didn't just say that. But I say sometimes we get to put ourselves in somebody's uh, shoes. Look at this. Wherefore, henceforth, can we go back to verse 15? Let's see what the wherefore is all about. Verse 15. And, and that he died for all, Jesus, that they which live should not from now on live to themselves but unto him who died for them and rose again and now says read the next verse verse 16 that's the, the next verse which says we should okay therefore from now on know we no man after the flesh let the person's former life stay where it is don't know people after, look at this Yes, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet no, from now on, we know him after the flesh no more. We always want to know people after the flesh, their former lifestyle. No, but we got to expect fresh encounters and those are the type of persons that are going to come to church. Express, expect fresh encounters. Number two, at and behave as though you have a great responsibility before God. Number three. 
Remember that God has provided us with great power. Number four. Number four. We got to develop a presence-centered church. There's too much fooling around in the church. Too much fooling around. But we want when we come, even if we are not fooling around, because we can sit down very pious, but there's no manifestation of God's presence. We don't want that. We want a manifestation of God's presence. If God's presence comes down upon us and we are breaking up all the chairs, I prefer that. Then for us to sit down this pious way and, you know, like somebody said, it's better to have oil fire than no fire at all. At least oil fire, you can put some water on it and control it. But when you don't have any fire at all, you're going to freeze. So, we want to develop a presence-centered church. A model church. That is like this. Listen, when I talk about presence-centered church, this is what I mean. A church that is experiencing the presence of Christ. I don't mean by presence that God is present everywhere. Yes, he's present everywhere. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about his manifested presence. Okay? You might be surprised, brethren, when there's a manifested presence of God in the church, you'll be surprised to see what happens, you know. Sometimes somebody's over there shaking like a leaf. Presence of God. Have you ever seen anybody that touch a live wire? One of those tall ones up on the top of the pole? Huh? When the power and the anointing of God begins to flow, people shake. People fall. People who don't know any better talk about them, people who just fall on the ground. That's why those people don't any, ever experience any power of God. Do you see any power of God manifested in the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Gnostic Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Jehovah's Witnesses Church, uh, the Methodist Church? Do you ever see the power of God manifested in those churches for healing? I'm not criticizing, I'm teaching them. Huh? I'm not tearing down because we're all trying try to do the same thing. But it is where the power of God is manifest. That's why they call us Pentecostal people. It is in the Pentecostal churches that you see this kind of stuff. Because we believe in things that they don't believe in. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And that is where the power comes. So a Christ, a, a, a presence-centered church experiences the presence of Christ. And we don't mean once every six months. I mean in every church service. I pray today that our service tonight will be just as serious as we have on Sundays. We came in, the devil wanted to act up. System began to sound real foolish. You, you understand what I'm saying? But I know the devil is a liar. He just got to wait. There's something called the spirit of backlash. That's what Bayesians call it, the spirit of backlash. Some people call it the spirit of retaliation. Where whenever God moves on this side, the devil is going to move. You have an army. When one side moves in the army, you think the other one is going to play that? So when we go against the enemy, like we are going against him, no. We expect to happen when you get home tonight. The devil there with this spirit of backlash already waiting for you. God, talk to me, somebody. But we have the power in the name of Jesus. Power not only to say, devil, I rebuke you, but power to close the lips. God has given you a lot of power in your mouth, you know. Shut your mouth sometimes. Are you with me, anybody? By the present center church, I mean that we are equipping people for life and ministry. We are engaging a lost world. That's what the present center church is going to do. We must be present with God to experience the presence of God. You got to be in somebody's presence to experience the presence. Am I making sense? Yeah. You see? Everyone has so many plans and strategies and programs and good initiatives in the churches. But the question you must ask, with all these programs, do you have God's presence? Here in this church, we never had a multitude of programs, you know. We never had a lot of programs. I don't think we ever had an a, a, a official youth leader, a women's leader, men's leader. Because those that have the idea of taking church in a wrong direction. You have a women's leader come to church to lead the church tonight. She had a chance to pray today. She didn't have a chance to read the Bible. But what she's going to tell you? You know? 
And my idea is that if God has not called you into the ministry, into a particular ministry, no pastor should put you into that ministry. We should not be putting people to teach that God did not give them the gift of teaching. We should not put people to pastor that God did not call to pastor. Every man should hold his lane. That person that I say I will not put the pastor, God has given him something to do. But it might be getting the flowers for the church, on Sunday, but he doesn't want that. Because it's not a big up something. Everybody wants to be big up. So when we're talking about having plans and strategies and program for the church, all of that without the presence of God is a waste of time. So Moses was going on a journey and he said to the Lord, Lord, if you are not going with us, let us not go. We need the presence of God in all our programs. I know here at this church, you probably think that I'm an old fogey and we should be doing a whole lot more. A lot more of what? A lot more of what? Did the Lord say to do it? Can you guarantee the presence of the Lord? Why do we have to have this? Because another church has it? Not necessarily. What other plans and programs in the church we have? We must understand that we need God's presence. But listen to this. For years, pastors and church planters have been taught to pursue, to pursue things. But is it God-initiated planning? Even in this church right now, we've got to be very careful. God, we have two pastors. That is not an easy thing in the church. Because the Lord might be sending me one direction and sending the other one in the other direction. How that will work out, I wouldn't know. So everything that we plan to do in the church must be god initiated planning it must come from god we're talking about the present center church we, we've got to be careful if you're going to do anything in the church if we're going to have, whatever we're going to have whatever programs we're going to have are we going to have a harvest thanksgiving program are we going to have a conference all these things we see people doing on zoom and people don't all here. but the question is is it something that is initiated by god if it is not initiated by God, it's doomed for failure. We need the presence of God in everything. The need for God's presence, the need to pray without ceasing, cannot be overstated. However, there's also something called the cultivated presence of God. The cultivated presence of God you find this in James chapter 4 and verse 8, where the Lord says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I think it's James 4, 8, I'm, yes, draw nigh to God. This is in the presence of God. Huh? They call it the cultivated presence of God, but I perhaps would not call it that. Um, what you have to do to make sure that you have this divine presence of God is to do a few things. Number one, you got to remove spiritual barriers. This is a very technical side. You've got to be very careful with this. You need to remove some barriers that hinder the church while remaining biblical. Now, right now, we remove, we remove all the barriers, although they may not be biblical. For example, listen to me carefully, because I'm just reading what the scripture says. People like to think that I'm into false doctrine. The Bible says that a man should not have long hair. The law was not stupid when he wrote that. So people come up these days and say, well, that was, in, that was in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament. No, that is written in the New Testament of 1 Corinthians. I'm not going to argue about that, because the church that you love... The musician might be a long hair man with his hair down to his waist, but he could play real good. So that's one of the barriers that we remove, but it's not scriptural. That's one of the barriers that we remove, but it's not scriptural. So when you're removing barriers to have, to have free access, I could think of a church in Barbados, a very big church in Barbados, where I keep saying to myself, if the founder, pastor, who was there for over 50 years, could see what's going on, now he will roll in his grave. 
Because all kinds of barriers have been removed. I think it was only last Sunday that people walk out of the church because of an issue that was being handled in a way that they didn't think. So you got to be careful removing barriers. Now on the platform, the girl, the ladies are in their short um, armhole dresses and their tight pants, all their butt showing and uh, everything. And they say, well, we dress. Look, the Bible says that you should not be partakers of another man's sin. And if you're up there causing men to lust after you, you're partaker of another man's sin. And if you don't want to give me amen, it's okay. I'm not fine. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. All right? So you, 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 you up there in your tight pants and all your legs showing and all parts you'll be showing. And you say, the Bible says, dress modestly. I don't know how that could be modest. Because if you're going to meet, if you're going to meet the, the damn Sandra Mason, you probably will not even dress that way. There are some barriers that we are removing. And some hypocrites don't do them when they come to church. But oh, the church, a hypocrite, a hypocrite by the way, is somebody that practices what they're not. You know in your heart that you want to dress that way. But when you come to church before, between these four walls, you know, well, the pastor, you say the pastor doesn't like that, so I don't dress this way. But when you go in the supermarket and when you go in other places, you dress like it. But the pastor is not the ones who set the rules. So there are lots of other things. Last time we spoke about, we talked about speaking in tongues. Where the Bible clearly says in 1 Corinthians 14, 27, that if you do not have an interpreter, yes, speak in tongues. Speak to God, but be silent in church unless you have an interpreter. I don't understand what we don't understand about that. We can bring that up in 1 Corinthians again, 14, 27. Yes, the Bible doesn't stop me from speaking in tongues. But the Lord said, if you speak in tongues and everybody speak in tongues and somebody come to the church and hear everybody speaking in tongues, they will think that we are mad. And that is true. You imagine somebody comes through there now who's not saved and everybody speaking in tongues. So the Lord said, don't do that. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or three and that by course and let somebody else interpret. Look at the next verse. Verse 28. But if there is no interpreter... That's simple English, man. Let him keep silence in the church. What is about that? That we can't understand. Let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself. He's still speaking in tongues, but he's speaking to himself and to God. He has good contact with God. You understand? So I'm talking about removing barriers. We need to remove barriers. People remove barriers like you could be married to another man and still get ordained as the bishop of the church. That's a barrier that has been removed, but that's not biblical. The Bible says the leader in the church should be the husband of one wife. People use that to attack women who are female pastors and say they can't be the husband of one wife. That's true, but suppose you got two yourself. You miss me? You miss what I just said? A husband, a pastor should be the husband of one wife. A woman can't be the husband of one wife. So they use that to say, you can't have female pastors. But look at it the other way. Suppose you yourself are the husband of more than one wife. Because if you are married, the Bible says clearly, unless and until that other person die, you are married to them. You'll find that in Corinthians as well. I'm talking about removing barriers out of the church that are, that are not right. Those are barriers that we remove. Those are barriers that we remove. Which ought not to be removed. Uh, there, are, there are some hard barriers that we need to remove. And then there are some structural barriers in the church that we need to remove. So let me show you then, finally. I'm starting now to talk a little bit about revival. I have 10 minutes and I just want to read a passage. This passage is going to be in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 is a story of great revival. This happens when we pray. When we pray, we have the presence of God. I tell you, revival is going to come. Anybody get anything on what I've said so far? Anybody get anything on what I've said so far? Okay. Now, look at revival. I'm reading this one. I have about... 10, 15, 14 different cases of revival in the Bible. And I want you to look at this and begin at Luke chapter, Luke chapter 3, begin at verse 2. And I'm going to read 18 verses, 
to let you see the sort of language that is used sometimes in order to push or stimulate people. Sometimes we think that everything must be nice and dandy. Listen to this. Luke chapter 3, verse, 20, verse 2. Towards the end, you're going to see the results of this, this revival. Verse 2. Annas, Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priest, the word came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country of Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 3, verse 5, every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made plain. We are talking about preparing a place for the Lord, huh? And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now listen to verse 7. We are talking about revival. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. They came to be baptized. Oh, generation of vipers. If I said that in this church, you won't come back to church. Oh, generation of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? We are going to see how these words... Although you may not like the words, sometimes you might not like the words that the pastor says, but if he has any kind of common sense, the words that he says were carefully calculated. So when I say something, for example, it's gone through my brain a number of things, and I'm wondering, should I say this or not? So if you hear me say, it, it didn't just fly out. It's not like when you do the hemlock maneuver and piece of pork comes up over your throat. No, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not like that. It is being, it is being carefully thought of. Oh, generation of vipers, who we'll warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. See how he's challenging them into revival? Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance uh, and begin not to say within yourself that we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of the stones to raise up children of Abraham. Listen how he's challenging them now to verse 9. And now the axe is laid upon the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people ask him, saying, what shall we do? See how revival is going to come? You need to have messages from the pulpit that will make you mad, stir your, stir your heart, make you, make you repent. In five out of seven churches in the book of Revelation, God told them to repent. He had something adverse to say about them. But we, when we come to church, we want to hear all the time for God so loved the world. We want to hear nice things every time we come to church. We don't want to come, we don't want anybody to come near to us with the sin that we're in. But listen to verse 11. The verse 11. They asked, what shall we do then? He answered and said unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. He that hath meat, hath meat, let him do likewise. And I will say things like, You've been hating your husband for 30, 40 years. You're coming to the end of your days. It's time for you to start working on that. Because no unforgiven person will be going to heaven. And if you don't forgive your husband or your wife, let's reverse it. If you don't forgive, you're going to hell. These are things that must be said to stimulate, to stir up, to get people to think. Because if you look at the newspaper, you will see lots of people that you know that are around your age that are dead. They have died recently. So you have to work. You have some things that have been embedded in you for so long. You got to start working on them now. Because you don't want to die not having forgiven. Otherwise crap or smoke your pipe. Those are things that get people angry. But those are things that should make sense to people. Well, people say, you know what? A zillion years in hell is just the beginning. I can't spend a zillion years in hell. So I have to eat my humble pie. And they're going to have to go back to my spouse or whatever and try to forgive. So he said to them in verse, verse 12, the publicans came though. Then came the publicans to be baptized and he said unto them, and, and they said, Master, what shall we do? You're asking what you should do and God has given the answer from the public, but you don't want to do it. Verse 13, he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed you because you know the publicans were the tax collectors and they were allowed to take four times as much tax as they can as they ought to one portion will go into the government and three portions will be to them that's why Zacchaeus was able to say um, when he got saved I'm going to repair all the taxes that I took from people because they were rich 
And the soldiers likewise, he demanded them saying, they asked God, what should we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man. He needs to speak to the policemen and then again today. Only this week, three, three young boys, seven years old, were murdered in Trinidad. Apparently because they were driving a vehicle and the police told them to stop. And they decided that they're going to run because they decided if we stop, they're going to kill us. So let us run. And three died in a car that had a probably about five. And people are dying everywhere all across America because of, of police brutality. I'm saying that now because this case here is dealing with policemen and soldiers. Okay, look at it again. The soldiers demanded of them saying, what shall we do? And he said, don't do violence to any man, soldiers, policemen. Neither accuse any faults. He don't write on something at the end of the statement that the person did not say. From, right, from very early when it was about 11 years, I remember that I was told that when I was writing a statement for the Border Hall Police Station, a fellow who was going to church with us ran across the road and got killed. And it was one of the witnesses and they said, one police called me aside and said to me, when you finish sign your name by the full stop, don't sign your name at the bottom because if you sign your name at the bottom, the police could come back and write in all and say there what you didn't say. But your name at the bottom, so it's going to go as though you say. Anybody understand what I just said? And look, it says here, do violence to no man, neither, neither accuse, that's false accusation, neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. Don't take bribes. To increase your wages. Don't sell drugs. We are talking about soldiers here. Eh? This will include policemen. The Bible, uh, the Bible addresses everybody. And when these things are taken care of, you're going to have a present center church. The glory of God is going to fill the church like, like waters cover the sea. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John whether he was the Christ. And John answered and said, and, and they went on to talk. Um, and you'll find that these people turn to the Lord. So we are creating a culture of prayer. We are creating a culture of revival. We can talk about revival next time. When I, next, next time I'm going to minister, maybe not Sunday morning. We're going to look at Asa. I think we're going to be looking at Asa, yes. And the revival that he brought to the land in 2 Chronicles chapter 15. And then we're looking at Elijah and the revival that he brought. But we're going to pick out key words in the scripture to show you what they did in order to see this revival. So brethren, leave here tonight expecting fresh encounters. I just said fresh blessings, you know. I said fresh encounters. You have some encounters with the devil. He'll attack your health. He's come to steal, to kill, and destroy. He'll attack everything you have. So expect fresh encounters. Behave as though you understand that you are responsible to God. You have a great responsibility. Remember also that with the great responsibility, God has given us great power. So that's what we're going to do. And with this power to pray and all this sort of stuff, we are going to develop a presence-centered church. God's presence, I mean, the presence of Jesus. So that when you walk into the church. I remember a few years ago, there was something going on at the church in Florida. And it happened in Canada as well, where people just laughed through the whole service. People consider it to be a, a move of God. I don't know if it was or not. But people were fly from all this, the continents. And they will come to Florida to this church that people were just laughing. But do you know that strangers walk in the road? And this is what I pray. When they just put their feet on the property of the church. You know, they, they don't know what's going on. They start laughing and falling under the anointing. That's what we want to see. That when you come through those doors. I see a gentleman in the door here. I can't remember seeing it before. But we ought to be able to read his mail. Let him know that God is real. If he doesn't know, I don't know. Huh? A Christ-centered church. And that means a lot of things. It means removing barriers. Um, but still remaining sound in doctrine. It remaining me, remaining barriers in the heart. Things like spiritual pride and immorality and gossip. And bitterness and unforgiveness. And lack of church discipline. Those are heart barriers. Those are barriers of the heart. Those are blessing blockers. We got to deal with those. And then we thought we could talk about structural barriers. And one of the structural barriers that we have in churches these days is time restraints. Most churches like this expect when two hours, we're done. 
If God wants to move at one hour and 59 minutes, if he wants to move now for another hour, we are not there. We, everybody's going to be looking at the watch. We're ready to go home. That's one of the structural barriers that we got to, we, we, we got to remove. Um, ineffectual programs, you have programs that don't work. Those are structural barriers that ought to be removed. Um, controlling members or controlling leaders, those ought not to be so. Fruitless traditions, you have traditions in church that they're fruitless. You might be surprised to know things that people ask me, like, well, pastor, I don't hear a blessing in the offering. And I will say, you think that I, the pastor, will receive the money and carry it to the bank without blessing it? Oh, you want me to bless it on the platform? So you must have noticed I started blessing on the platform. What was the benefit? Whether they bless it on, bless it on the platform or bless it when they take it to the bank. So there are some fruitless traditions that need to be removed. Okay? And then we will go into talking about uh, revival. All these things will lead to revival. And revival is what we really, really want. The simplicity of the gospel.